In this lecture, we talk for a minute about different approaches to diversification. That is, you don't always have to build. Sometimes you can buy. And you don't always have to be going it on your own. Sometimes you can partner with other companies or other firms, like joint ventures, strategic alliances, and the like. So there's different possibilities. We'll talk about what they are. And then in other lectures, we'll go into a little bit more about how each of these works. We'll talk about that a little bit, but we'll talk about it later as well. One you can do is acquire business. If things are going well and you want to expand into a new territory, you want to expand into a new business, you might purchase or acquire a company. That is, a company that you feel is in an industry you want to go into, that you can get into at a reasonable cost, and that you feel owning that company along with your current assets is better, you're better off. Your shareholders are better off. Those are the criteria we talked about last time. So you go and you think and you shop and you buy a business. Second thing you can do is just start it up on your own. Internal growth, you do internal venturing, whatever. You start a business and you try to grow it and fund it and make it better and stronger. The third thing, of course, you could do is find a good partner and jump in there and work with that partner to start a company either in a new territory you don't understand or potentially with technologies that you get from your partner. Those are some of the possibilities. If you're going after the purchase, an important element is what's called the acquisition premium. That is, when you're buying a company, it usually has a certain value associated with it. The people that are running it know what that value is. They understand how much money they make. And they see that they'll be able to do that for their shareholders well into the future. So when you come in, you have to actually come and explain to them and convince them that you would take over that business and they're going to want more from you than they would be able to do if they did it on their own. That's the premium, the acquisition premium. That means you're actually willing, in some cases, to pay more than the current business is worth. This is not always the case. The ideal situation, of course, is to find a business that's undervalued. But you can't always do that whenever you are the one that's approaching companies to purchase them. And the way that you figure out that, it's, that, that you can pay more than it is currently worth is that you have to have be able to identify synergy that comes from you purchasing the company that you can then use. And when you purchase the company, you have more benefit. Your, the sum of the parts is more than the whole. You have synergy. So therefore, you actually get more value, and you feel like you can pay that premium and still get more out of it in the end than, than the competitors get. The whole notion, of course, as you negotiate these deals is that you do not want to transfer your synergy, the synergy you bring to the table, to the shareholders of the selling company. So that's where the trickiness of your negotiation comes into play. But these are the things to keep in mind as you think about the acquisition, merger and acquisition approach to expansion or diversification into new industries. Corporate venturing, that's the sort of thing where you start a business. And it's also known oftentimes as corporate venturing. It's well, corporate venturing, corporate entrepreneurship. Sometimes it's called entrepreneurship. This is when a company that has assets and has skills wants to diversify into a new industry, sees an opportunity, and feels the very best way for them to take advantage of that opportunity is to start their own business. They feel they have the skills, they have the knowledge, they have the resources, and they see the opportunity, and they feel able to cope with it or to, to, to capitalize on it, on it. That is your corporate venturing or intrapreneurship. Many times, new businesses, new areas, new opportunities, new innovations of existing companies are done exactly the same way entrepreneurs start new businesses on their own, only you do it under the umbrella of a company, and that's called corporate entrepreneurship. When do you decide to do it yourself? Well, first of all, if you have the resources to do it, if you know what you're going to do, that's this purple uh, one there on this chart that's off um, about, what, 10 o'clock on, uh, on this PowerPoint. Um, you also have to have time. If time to market is important, you don't have time to grow a small business. But if you're entering a new industry and you feel like you have as many uh, of the skills as anyone else, then you could grow it yourself. If you feel like you need to be there in a big way right away, then you might want to look for an asset to purchase. There's also 
there might be a really high cost of purchasing companies if that particular industry is hot, can't really afford to purchase it, or it doesn't make sense. The acquisition premiums would outweigh the benefits you get from your synergies, for example. Um, you might have some additional capacity that you can use. Um, you might have firms that are relatively weak. They don't really have, for example, if you're a technology firm, you have that better technology and renewable energy, for example, than, than competitors. You may be able to go in there with a stronger, uh, a stronger product suite than they have. And there's not that much real competition. The market is growing so fast, perhaps, that people aren't really competing with one another. Everyone's just rushing to offer products and services to many of the customers that are entering the market and purchasing and buying. So there's a real opportunity. You have the skills to get in there. It's not all that head-to-head -head competition. That is a little guy going in. You probably can be just as successful as anyone else. These are the sorts of things, and you have time. These are the th sorts of things that would cause you to want to go in there and sort of do it on your on your own. At other times, somebody really knows an industry, knows a territory, knows an area, and so you might want to join venture with them. If, for example, we were talking earlier about a real estate and development company. Maybe you decide you want to expand out of the New York area to another metro area, um, for example, Chicago or something. Uh, you may find another commercial firm there that you have good skills match for. They know the territory. They know the, the, the government and regulatory environment. They know how um, uh, they have contacts in construction and per permitting and all of that. You could go and find a partnership there and build a partner. If there's lots of complicated and complex environment, uh, specific things to know, your partner could bring that to the table. Um, if that's the case, then oftentimes the joint venture is the best model. Joint venture allows both firms to learn from each other. Usually they have very complementary assets. And generally, they last for a period of time. And then the joint venture either dissolves or it goes with one partner or the other. Um, some of the telecom, telecommunications companies uh, that we know today, uh, Verizon, for example, was originally a joint venture between Verizon and uh, a European uh, mobile phone company. So there's, and then it became part of Verizon. So oftentimes you have uh, companies that, that start off as joint ventures and then become part of the expansion plans of one of the other companies. Those are the things to think about. So how do you decide? Well, you decide on the industry itself. You decide whether or not you have the capability yourself to do this. If, you, if the industry is attractive and you have the capabilities to do it, what, is it, what does it cost to get in? What are the entry barriers? Again, if, if the cost starts to be too high, then you might want to think about other alternatives that, than the, the one that you had, in, had considered before. Joint ventures, for example, tend to be faster than starting it on your own, slower than acquisition, if you're particularly good at acquisitions, which some organizations are and others stumble quite often. Many acquisitions fail. Um, but they're fast. You're there. You buy the company and you're in there. But then, of course, you have other things you have to figure out. So you have to compare acquisition, joint venture, on all of these different metrics to decide what is the best way for you to decide that you want to actually go in and enter a marketplace. And, and move forward. In all of these cases, there is this notion of transaction costs. These are basically get waste that disappears. It's like the cost of buying your driver's license, um, your contracting costs. If you buy a company, you have to pay bankers. You have to pay. Uh, sometimes you have to pay off liabilities and the like. If you're doing a joint venture, you have a lot of legal costs associated with that. Travel costs back and forth. Uh, contracting that and the like. And of course, with startup, you also have lots of uh, issues and problems with financing and small starts and the like. In any of these cases, transaction cost is a very important area to fully understand. One of the reasons a lot of firms make mistakes in acquisitions and the like is they don't fully appreciate the transaction costs associated with entering into new markets. So these are the sorts of things that we, we would tend to worry about when you're deciding how best, what mechanism, what mode, what mode of operations of business, acquisition, start your own, joint or, or you know, corporate venturing, or joint venture partnership. Which of those modes is best for you as a firm as you tend to expand? In the next discussion, we'll talk about how when you make those moves, 
Are you doing it in what's called a related way, that is, industries that are very tightly connected or unrelated, where you're act, act, acting more like a money manager or portfolio manager? The puts and takes of each of those and how one has a successful strategy one way or the other, uh, we'll talk about all the puts and takes of that in the very next lecture. See you then.